Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. I'm David Moskowitz. I'm head of government relations and public policy at Wells Fargo, and I'm very pleased to be here with you today. We are pleased to serve for the eighth year as a charter sponsor of the Book Festival, and even prouder to watch the Book Festival grow into the incredibly popular and impactful event it has become. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Thank you. Wouldn't be surprised to see us move the needle on some bestseller list today. Um, but it's even more important to keep the Book Festival a free event that serves the community. Uh, the Library of Congress and the Book Festival's real purpose here is literacy, which leads to learning and opportunity, which matches our goal of helping our community succeed. Learning to love books and learning to love learning are what the Book Festival is all about. In this session, Ron Chernow will discuss his biography of Ulysses Grant, if we're lucky, certain other popular founding fathers. <laughs> One thing I learned from <laughs> the story of President Grant was how people can evolve and through persistence and hard work, acknowledge and overcome their imperfections. It's an incredible story that reminded me of, that a person of goodwill can really learn from their mistakes and reach their potential. I hope you enjoy this session. Now it's my privilege to introduce the Deputy Director of National and International Outreach at the Library of Congress and our session moderator, Colleen Shogan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the 18th Annual National Book Festival. I'm pleased to be joined on stage today by Ron Chernow. Ron is an award-winning journalist, historian, and biographer. He's won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the National Book Award for Nonfiction. In 2015, he won the National Humanities Medal. His book on Alexander Hamilton was the inspiration for the award-winning musical for which Ron worked as a historical consultant. The Library of Congress is honored to have you join us today at the National Book Festival. It's, it's worth noting that uh, our co-chair of the festival, Mr. David Rubenstein, was supposed to conduct this interview today. But due to scheduling changes uh, because of Senator McCain's funeral, he was unable to do so. But I have David's questions here today, <laughs> and I just happen to be a big admirer of Ulysses S. Grant and Ron's books. Uh, so I think we're going to have a fantastic time here today at the Book Festival. Before we talk about Grant, uh, we need to ask a question about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> how could we not? Who's uh, he? <laughs> yeah, who's he? Uh, so when Lin-Manuel Miranda first approached you and said that he wanted to create a hip-hop musical based upon your book, uh, what was your reaction? And did you ever think it would become a cultural phenomenon? Well, you know, very often, Colleen, people uh, say to me, when you were writing the Alexander Hamilton biography, did you have any idea that it would be turned into a hip-hop musical? And I always think to myself, I think the question answers itself. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I first met uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, which was back in the fall of uh, 2008, Lin was still starring in his uh, first musical, In the Heights, and uh, he asked me on the spot to be the historical advisor to this as yet non-existent uh, show. So I left and I said to him, you mean you want me to tell you when something's wrong? And he said with great fervor, he said, yes, I want the historians to take this seriously, uh, which was music to my ears. And I was, I was a little bit skeptical, but I was quite intrigued. And I thought that nothing could be more delightful than to watch the evolution of a Broadway musical. I was a lifelong theater goer, and the offer to be on the other side of the uh, footlights was absolutely irresistible, and of course it turned out to be a rocket ride far, right. far beyond Absolutely. anything that I could have anticipated. So we'll move on to Grant, which you've certainly written the definitive biography of, of Grant, and I, I have to start with a kind of a cute question, but it has a good story to it. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Uh -huh. <laughs> when I first started working on the book, which was in uh, 2011, uh, I found that approximately half the people uh, whom I told I was working on Grand shot back, who's buried in Grand's tomb? Mm -hmm. So naturally, I got very interested in the origin of this joke. Well, I traced it back to Groucho Marx. You can trace everything back to Groucho Marx. <laughs> and Groucho, some of you are old enough to remember, had a quiz show in the 1950s called You Bet Your Life. And Groucho was dismayed that 
so many of the contestants could not answer a single one of the questions. So Groucho decided that he would ask every contestant a question that every contestant to, could answer. And that question was, who's buried in Grant's tomb? To Groucho's astonishment, half the guests got it wrong. <laughs> But such is the staying power of a great comedian that the line has become part of the popular culture. Let's start at the beginning with Grant. Where was he born? What were the conditions of his upbringing? What was his family like? He was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio. He grew up in a series of uh, small towns in southwestern Ohio, near Cincinnati. And uh, Point Pleasant was right on the Ohio River. And the significance of that uh, was that um, it separated the free state of Ohio from the slave-owning state of Kentucky. In fact, on winter evenings, the Ohio would freeze over and refugee, fugitive slaves would uh, sprint to freedom. Very important, I think, in terms of thinking about Grant later with Appomattox, that he uh, grew up really uh, straddling you know, the world of both North and South and understood both of their cultures. Came from actually fairly well-to-do family. His father was a rich tanner and mayor of one of those uh, three uh, towns, um, and his father was really the bane of his life. His father was a very pushy and domineering uh, character. Mm -hmm. um, and then Grant went to West Point because Grant wanted to go to West Point. No, he did not, but his father wanted him mm -hmm. to go. And his father was kind of a skinflint who saw West Point as a free form of vocational education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did he do at West Point? Actually, fairly well. It was, I would say his performance was lackluster. He was. Uh, 21st in the class of mm -hmm. uh, 39, but there was already considerable attrition uh, before that. Uh, he became famous for two things at the academy. One was he was probably the best horseman of his generation, uh, if not century, at the academy. He established a high jumping record on this horse named York. They set the bar at more than five feet and Grant managed to clear it. It was a record that uh, was not equaled for many decades at the academy. He was also very good at drawing. Now this may seem strange and insignificant, but cadets were taught drawing because it was thought important for uh, generals to be able to draw maps during battles. And uh, Grant was very good at drawing and during the Civil War, he had an uncanny ability to visualize mm -hmm. the uh, battlefield, and it all comes from this very visual sense that he had and that was first reflected in his uh, capacity to draw. After West Point, he has a number of assignments, and then he eventually ends up as a quartermaster in the Mexican War. Why is his service as a quartermaster, why does that turn out to be important? Extremely important, because um, being quartermaster in uh, Mexico uh, gave Grant a nuts and bolts knowledge of the logistics of an army. And kind of looking ahead to the Civil War, you know, Grant would be uh, in charge of four or five different armies uh, stretched across a 1,300 mile um, front. And so Grant's mastery of logistics, his mastery of the railroad and the telegraph really enabled him to supervise these vast armies. And it goes back to being quartermaster at Mexico. And also very um, uh, importantly, as quartermaster, Grant was not obligated to actually fight. He could have stayed behind the lines, but he made a point of volunteering to fight in every single uh, combat that his troops were involved in. That's kind of real courage, that's real patriotism. After the Mexican War, he marries Julia Dent. And what was she like and what was her family like? Okay, so Grant comes from this abolitionist family in Ohio. He marries into a slave-owning family in uh, uh, Missouri. His father-in-law, Colonel Frederick Dent, the colonel was purely honorific, becomes the bane of his life. It's very hard on Grant. Uh, Julia was very outgoing and uh, vivacious. And Julia um, always had a vision of Grant's uh, future that he sometimes did not have himself. Uh, during the 1850s, he's mm -hmm. trying and failing to establish himself as a farmer in uh, St. Louis, and he fails at a real estate uh, venture. And during this very bleak period in Grant's life, Julia has a dream uh, one night. She dreams that her, that her husband is going to be president of the United States. And when she tells her friends and family about this dream, everyone laughs. Nothing can seem more preposterous. This man is struggling just to support a wife and four children. Julia knew. Mm -hmm. You spend a fair amount in the book talking about Grant's struggle with alcohol. Mm -hmm. What did you conclude? Did he have a problem with drinking? And what sort of evidence did you use to draw those conclusions? Well, historically, the debate about Grant has always been, uh, you know, was he a drunkard or not? And I always found just the term drunkard is such a kind of loaded moralistic uh, term because it implies that a person who was 
dissipated and irresponsible and was kind of gleefully indulging this uh, vice. Um, I felt that um, I tried to approach it through what I hope is our more enlightened attitude. He was, he was an alcoholic. I say that because he could never have just one drink. Mm -hmm. I say that because even one glass of uh, alcohol changed his personality. But this was something that he struggled against his entire life. He was already a member of a temperance lodge when he was in his 20s. The reason I think there's been so much difficulty that previous writers had with Grand's drinking is that um, he was a binge drinker. He was an episodic uh, drinker, so that he could go for two or three months without touching glass of alcohol. He would then have two or three day benders that even people who were closely with him would not actually see him uh, during those sprees, as they were uh, uh, called. And so, but it's a problem that he struggles with. And by the time he becomes president, he's largely conquered it. But it certainly is a problem that bedevils him throughout the Civil War. Uh, and that causes him to leave the military, it precipitates uh, an exit from the military. Yes, in, in, in 1854, he was assigned to a couple of very lonely, bleak uh, garrisons in Oregon, Northern California, where he could not afford to bring his wife and children. He was lonely, he was depressed, he starts drinking. And then in 1854, he shows up one day at a pay table, uh, drunk, and is really drummed out of the surface, service. It was very significant, because the peacetime army was really very small. Uh, and so there was a very active rumor mill. So all of the stories, Grant's history of drinking, um, will follow him into the Civil War and will very much kind of color how uh, people uh, see him. I think that probably were it not for that uh, history and all of these stories about Grant's drinking, uh, Abraham Lincoln might well have brought Grant East much mm -hmm. sooner in the war mm -hmm. to act as general in chief. So now Grant's a civilian, and uh, you have a very poignant description of him. He ends up on the streets of St. Louis selling firewood to support his family. How does that happen? Yeah, OK, he tried making it as a farmer. Uh, Julia, as a wedding gift from her father, had received 60 acres, which Grant uh, worked. He was very industrious, but he could not make uh, a go of it. So he ends up taking um, uh, firewood. Uh, it's 10 miles into uh, St. Louis, and he actually walks beside the, uh, the wagon. People who saw him in those days selling firewood on street corners in St. Louis said that he was bearded, disheveled, unkempt looking. In fact, one of his old army buddies ran into him on the street and was really shocked by Grant's unkempt appearance. And he said to him, Grant, what are you doing? Grant's response was very poignant. He said, I'm solving the problem of poverty. Uh, he was so poor at that, yeah, he was so poor at that point uh, that um, one Christmas he had to pawn his watch to buy Christmas presents for his um, family. This was circa 1857. Civil War breaks out 1861. But then something happens, Fort Sumter. And you write in your book, uh, Grant eventually joins the volunteer infantry in Illinois and then gets a position in the Union Army. And you write in your book that a change overcomes Grant. What was that change? Well, you know, when the Civil War broke out, there was a desperate shortage of officers. You have to remember about um, a third of the Army um, officers were from the South. So many of them, uh, most of them, defected to the Confederacy. So there was a crying need for trained people. Uh, Grant still had all of that lore from West Point stored in his mind. Um, he had fought with great distinction in the uh, Mexican War, had been assigned to four different frontier garrisons um, uh, before the, the Civil War. And so uh, his efficiency mm -hmm. and his military knowledge immediately come to the fore. And so Grant's rise gives um, new meaning to the term uh, meteoric. Um, two months after the outbreak of the Civil War, he's a colonel. Four months uh, after it, he's a brigadier general. 12 months after the outbreak of the Civil War, he's a major general. And by um, the end of the Civil War, this man who had been working as a clerk in his father's leather goods store in Galena, Illinois, back in 1860, that man who had seemed like a certifiable failure in life was general in chief of the Union Army with one million soldiers under his command far and away the largest military establishment in the country up until that time. Now, he has some early victories that catches the eye of Lincoln, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, very often if the, the history of the Civil War, there's kind of a disproportionate focus on Virginia. And if you look at Virginia, it seems like the Confederacy is winning battle after battle. If you look at what was happening in the Western theater of war, Grant was winning one victory after another. And in early 1862, he has kind of twin battles against twin forts 
all the way in the northwest corner of Tennessee, uh, Forts Henry and uh, Donaldson. They were significant for the following reason. Uh, Fort Henry uh, was on the Tennessee River, Fort Cumberland on the, uh, I'm sorry, Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. And those two rivers penetrated deep into the uh, Confederacy, particularly Grant's victory at Fort Donaldson was the first of three times that he captured an entire Confederate army, more than 13,000 people. It also led to a new nickname for Grant because the Confederate general inside the fort was Simon Buckner, who wanted, sent a message to Grant. Uh, he wanted commissioners appointed to negotiate a truce, and Grant wrote back, you know, no terms except um, unconditional and immediate mm -hmm. surrender will be accepted. I propose to move, move upon your works immediately. That unconditional surrender mm -hmm. line, he became, instead of U.S. Grant, he became mm -hmm. unconditional surrender uh, Grant. It was really kind of the first large-scale uh, victory of the war for the North. In late 1862, he issues General Order Number 11, yeah. which expels the Jews from his military district in the South because he believes that they're engaged in a, a illegal black market cotton ring. That's right. Yeah. And was Grant anti-Semitic, or did he regret that decision no, later he, I mean, on? No, he, he regretted it almost as, as, as soon as he issued it. Uh, as soon as Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton saw it, they immediately. Uh, overrode it. Grant said that he did regret it uh, almost instantly. It was an atrocious and inexcusable thing to do. People know that piece of the story. You know, what they don't know is Grant spent the rest of his life atoning for that mm -hmm. action. As president, he appointed more Jews to public office than all the other 19th century presidents combined. He became the first president to speak out on human rights abuses abroad. And in both cases, it was because of persecution of the Jews. One time, in Russia, one time in Poland. Then most remarkable of all, since we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., during the um, last year of his second term, uh, he was invited to the dedication of a synagogue called Adas Israel, a very tiny synagogue. Uh, Grant went with his son and with um, a U.S. Uh, senator. It was a three-hour ceremony. Here he's president of the United States. This was a congregation, probably had 40 or 50 people. One hour into the dedication of this uh, synagogue, uh, the elders of the synagogue went over to Grant and said, Mr. President, we're very touched that you would mm -hmm. come to this you know, humble function. You can leave now in good conscience. Mm -hmm. Grant insisted on staying the full three hours, reached into his pocket, gave a donation uh, to the uh, synagogue. He was not, um, it was kind of one of the pleasurable things writing about him. He was not a prejudiced man. He was not a man, mm -hmm. you know, full of uh, hatred. You know, you could read, I don't know, say William Tecumseh Sherman, his statements on, you know, blacks or um, Native Americans, kind of hair-raising, ferocious things. You don't see that in Grant's papers at all. So this was something that was really very out of character for him, and luckily he apologized and atoned for it mm -hmm. the rest of his life. He has a number of other successes. He has more manpower at this time, more resources. And then he has the victory at Vicksburg. Why is Vicksburg so impressive, and why it was, it was really a, a daring capture? Yeah, well, it happened, you know, um, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Memphis had fallen to Union forces, and it meant that the one great citadel, the one great bastion on the Mississippi River left to the Confederacy was Vicksburg. Vicksburg was located, at that time there was a bend in the Mississippi there that forced mm -hmm. boats to, to slow down. There were seven miles of very elaborate uh, fortifications, so it really seemed like this impregnable fortress. Um, Grant had really a very daring strategy to take uh, Vicksburg. Uh, under cover of night, uh, he had ironclads and transports come down the river despite heavy shelling from the Confederates. He also marched some troops down the western bank of the Mississippi. They then crossed over south of Vicksburg to the only high dry land in that area. And then, kind of, Grant has this lightning campaign. Uh, he wins uh, five major victories in a three-week mm -hmm. period, um, surrounds Vicksburg, lays siege to it, and Vicksburg surrenders. It was the same time as the victory at uh, Gettysburg. Um, and for a second time, Grant has captured an entire mm -hmm. Confederate army of more than 30,000 uh, soldiers. And so, at that point, 
the uh, Union not only controlled um, the Mississippi, but it bisected the Confederacy because a lot of the supplies, particularly horses and livestock, came from west of the Mississippi. So the Confederate Army was suddenly cut off from this major source of supplies west of the Mississippi. And that was Grant. When did President Lincoln bring Grant East to lead the Union Army? Well, what happens in February 1864, um, Congress passes a bill uh, reinstating the title of Lieutenant General. The only one who had ever held that was George Washington. Winfield Scott had kind of brevet Lieutenant General, uh, and Grant becomes that Lieutenant General. And it's a wonderful story, because in March 1864, he comes to Washington, although Lincoln loved Grant, he'd never actually set eyes on him before. Grant happened to arrive um, at the, uh, the, the same day that Lincoln was having a reception at the White House in the Blue Room, and uh, Grant uh, goes in, Lincoln warmly embraces him. And there was such pandemonium in the room because Grant was such a hero that they urged Grant to stand up on a sofa so that people could see him because he was relatively short. He stands up on the sofa, he's pers um, perspiring profusely um, so that people could see him. And Grant was always a little bit socially awkward. And Grant later said that the hottest campaign he ever fought was standing on that sofa <laughs> in the White House. <laughs> so Grant was impressive on a tactical level, on yeah. an operational level, yeah. and on a strategic level. Yeah. How rare was that to find all three qualities in a, in a general, and how did he compare to Robert E. Lee in that regard? Well, um, Sherman had a very interesting comment where he was comparing uh, uh, Grant and Lee. Uh, he said that Grant's strategy embraced a continent Lee's strategy embraced a state, Virginia. Mm -hmm. That is, um, Grant in a way had the har harder task. Lee just had to inflict so much pain uh, on Union forces that the Northern public would uh, weary and decide to give up the war. Grant actually had to capture and destroy uh, Robert E. Lee's uh, army. And um, he really had a strategic uh, vision because the various Union armies in different theaters of war had been operating independently of each other. Grant coordinated their movements uh, so that they, he turned them into a single uh, fighting uh, force. And he saw that the way to wear down the Confederacy was by having Union forces simultaneously attack different Confederate armies so that they could not kind of switch reinforcements from uh, one to another. Then he finally pins Robert E. Lee down mm -hmm. in uh, Richmond and uh, Petersburg. And there's another wonderful comment from Sherman. Sherman said, about Grant. He said, Robert E. Lee would attack the front porch. He said, Ulysses S. Grant would attack the bedroom and the kitchen. <laughs> I'm not sure what he meant about the bedroom. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, but in terms of attacking the kitchen, that again, this goes back mm -hmm. to Grant the Quartermaster, what he did with uh, Lee in Richmond and Petersburg is he began systematically to cut off every railway line and every canal that was feeding supplies. Uh, to Lee's army, finally starving it out and forcing him to flee west to Appomattox Courthouse where Grant and Sheridan overtake uh, Lee's army um, and force its surrender. And that was then the third Confederate army that Grant captured. Robert E. Lee never captured a single mm -hmm. Union army. How does Grant conduct himself at Appomattox? Oh, it's the most touching part of the story because he refuses to allow uh, his soldiers to gloat or uh, celebrate. Uh, he's very generous. These Confederate soldiers literally are starving. He issues rations to feed them. He allows the Confederate officers to keep their horses and firearms. And really, I think the most beautiful passage uh, in Grant's memoirs are, is about uh, the meeting at Appomattox, because Grant said that um, uh, he was sad and depressed when he met uh, Lee. And he, he writes, I felt like anything rather than rejoicing over the downfall of a foe who had fought with such valor um, and uh, suffered such hardship for a cause, although that cause was the worst mm -hmm. that any you know, army could have fought for. And I think it's a beautiful statement, particularly we've had a prolonged discussion about the Confederate monuments. And I think Grant, in a way, shows the way, because on the one hand, in that passage, he, play, he pays homage to the bravery of the Confederate soldiers. And they were brave. They were quite extraordinary in many, many uh, battles. At the same time, the cause for which they were fighting 
the perpetuation of slavery mm -hmm. was, as Grant says, one of the worst causes that mm -hmm. people fight for. So I think that, that the humanity and also the fairness and balance that he brought to that subject, I think is really one that should stay with us. Grant does not accept uh, President Lincoln's invitation to attend Ford's theater. Would history perhaps unfold it differently if Grant had been there? Yeah, it's quite a story, because what happened in late March 1864, Abraham and Mary Lincoln go down to City Point, Virginia, where Grant has his headquarters. Um, Mary Lincoln, who was showing increasing signs of um, mental instability, Mary Lincoln um, throws a jealous uh, fit. She imagines that the young wife of General Edward O. C. Ord is flirting with her husband, and she starts to berate young Mrs. Ord, who can't figure out what's going on, and bursts into tears. And Julia Grant was there. Julia Grant intervened to try to uh, protect uh, young Mrs. Ord, and we all know what happens when you try to intervene in the middle of the fight. <laughs> then Mary Lincoln turned on uh, Julia Grant and turned on her so angrily that um, the night that uh, the Lincolns went to Ford Theater, Lincoln thought it was very important that the public see the victorious president and the victorious general at the same time. Julia Grant, you know, laid down the law to her husband. She said, I refuse to go to Ford's Theater if Mary Lincoln is going to be there. So they made their, you know, excuses. They went off to Burlington, New Jersey, where they had a house. So um, one of the great what-ifs of history, if Ulysses S. Grant had been in that box at, the, at Ford's Theater with Lincoln, would he have had a security detail there? Would, with his military instincts, he have Mm -hmm. sensed, right. you know, the assassin entering the box. Or, of course, it's entirely possible that Booth would have killed mm -hmm. Grant as well as Lincoln. We'll never know. How did Grant manage to win the nomination, the Republican nomination, in 1868? Uh, had he showed an aptitude for politics previously? No, not, not really. In fact, there was kind of a great guessing game that went on in terms of what Grant's party affiliation uh, uh, was came from uh, you know Whig family. His only vote had been for uh, James Buchanan uh, for president. Really, no one knew exactly where he uh, stood. He was in the right place at the right time. You know, since Appomattox, he had a certain symbolic uh, standing in American mm -hmm. life as as the victor of the war and also reconciliation uh, between North and uh, South. And what happened in 1868? There was a failed attempt. They did impeach. President John, Andrew Johnson um, was not convicted, lost by a single vote, which weakened the radical Republicans in Congress. Grant kind of was in a position uh, to straddle both of the wings of the Republican uh, uh, Party, uh, still had this kind of immense prestige from the, uh, the war, and he did not uh, campaign openly uh, uh, for it. Grant had a funny kind of way of not campaigning for things, but sort of putting him in a position <laughs> where things ha just ha happen to happen to him. In his first term of office, the 15th Amendment is enacted uh, and ratified, and there's a backlash in the South. Uh, violence escalates, yeah. and there's a uh, strengthening of the Ku Klux Klan. You spend a lot of time in the book, and you handle it very deftly. What did Grant do to combat the Klan, and was he successful? Yeah, the, the Klan starts in Pulaski, Tennessee, 1866. It starts out as a social club of Confederate veterans, and they start uh, you know, wearing their old uniforms and um, drilling, and it becomes a militaristic uh, secret organization. And then, of course, they start putting on you know, robes and hoods at night on horseback and terrorizing people. And this was, you're absolutely right, prompted by the 15th Amendment. Nothing terrified the white South more than the black man, and it was only black men. Uh, uh, voting, and so the terror was very much directed against blacks voting or registering to vote. There was no Southern sheriff who would arrest a member of the Klan. Uh, there was no Southern jury that would convict a member of the Klan. There was no Southern white who would testify against the Klan. So there had been, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, murders of blacks that uh, went unprosecuted. Uh, Grant. Um, I had a very uh, crusading attorney general named Amos Ackerman from Georgia. Uh, Ackerman brought um, 3,000 um, indictments, uh, got more than 1,000 convictions uh, against the Klan, and crushed the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it was his greatest achievement as president. The Klan that we know 
uh, is really from the resurgence of the clan from the 19 teens and 1920s, the clan that is alas still with mm -hmm. us. And they've Chris borrowed a lot of the um, techniques and mm -hmm. ideology of the original clan. Mm -hmm. Why were there so many corruption-related scandals in Grant's two terms of office? Did he, was he complicit? Did he turn a blind eye? Or was he just oblivious to what was going on? Uh, Grant was in, incredibly naive. I'll tell the story from his childhood. It makes the point. Unfortunately, <laughs> he didn't get much better. Mm -hmm. when, he, when he was a boy, his uh, father uh, wanted to buy a horse. So he told uh, Ulysses to go to this farm, and, and uh, he uh, gave Ulysses these instructions. He said, uh, offer $20 to the farmer. Uh, if he doesn't take it, then offer him 20 to 50 And if he still doesn't you know, uh, bite, uh, offer 25 So Grant goes to the farmer and says, my father said I should offer you $20 for the horse, but if you don't take it, uh -huh. to offer you 20 to 50 And if you don't take that, to offer $25. Well, I wish I could say there was some learning curve in terms of grant and money, but there, there, there wasn't. And, uh, you know, unscrupulous uh, people uh, seem to spot grant a mile away. In fact, uh, during his second term in office, the so-called whiskey ring uh, scandal, uh, the, the brewers were evading this tax by paying off uh, revenue agents. And one of the people who was very involved in it was Grant's really chief of staff, a man named Oval Babcock. And um, when um, Babcock is being investigated, Grant writes a letter to Babcock's uh, wife saying, I have full faith in your husband's uh, integrity. He said, I've had the most you know, intimate and confidential relations mm -hmm. with your husband for um, uh, 14 years, and he says, I can't um, uh, believe that uh, he's not the trustworthy person uh, that I imagine. Guess what? He, he was. And as I said, he was kind of like chief of staff. He had the mm -hmm. desk right outside Grant's office, reviewed incoming and outgoing um, uh, mail, and um, Grant fired him while he assigned him. He became inspector of lighthouses uh, on the Florida coast. Mm -hmm. So after he leaves office, Grant goes on a trip around the world with his wife for two and a half years. Yeah. How was he received in this trip? It's kind of a post-presidency unlike any other. During that, you know, almost two and a half year period, um, he meets with virtually every head of state in the world. Uh, Queen Victoria receives him at Windsor Castle. Um, Prince uh, Bismarck uh, receives him in Berlin. The Pope at the Vatican. Uh, uh, is our Alexander II in St. Petersburg. And then he goes to the Far East, and the crowds are immense, like uh, 250,000 people at a time uh, would uh, turn out. And even you know, the, um, the emperor of Japan uh, would never actually touch people. When he saw Grant, he stepped forward and shook mm -hmm. hands with Grant, which was uh, unheard of. And Grant actually pioneers a certain post-presidential uh, role that would be followed by other presidents that he um, arbitrates a dispute over uh, post-war islands, uh, uh, offshore islands uh, between Japan and uh, China. You know, so he comes back with really this sort of great reputation, uh, very much uh, enhanced. Uh, he's become a statesman mm -hmm. on the world stage. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. After trying to get the nomination again in 1880, not not winning it, uh, he decides to move to New York City and try his hand in the investment world. How does that turn out? Well, again, money, disastrously, you know? <laughs> Question answers itself. Um, he formed a partnership with a young man named Ferdinand Ward, who was 29 years old, who was lionized as the young Napoleon of finance. Um, they created a partnership called Grant and Ward. It was the only time Grant ever allowed his name to Mm -hmm. be used uh, in a business. And of course, Grant's name attracted a lot of uh, money. Alas, for those of you who don't know the story, uh, Ferdinand Ward was the Bernie Madoff of his mm -hmm. day. It was, a, it was a Ponzi scheme. He was using money from new investors to pay outrageous rates of interest to the uh, old investors. And so poor Grant, with this incurable naivete, Grant imagines uh, that he's a multimillionaire. And he wakes up one day to find out that instead of being a multimillionaire, He's worth $80 and Julia's worth $130. Mm -hmm. That not only had Grant's um, uh, uh, fortune, what he thought was his fortune, uh, been wiped out, but you know, um, all of his children had invested with Madoff. He had a lot of cousins, he had a lot of uh, friends. So the entire Grant family was engulfed in this catastrophe. 
In 1884, Grant falls ill. What was wrong with him, and what was the prescribed treatment? Right, now, this, the illness um, really coincides with the exposure of the problem um, uh, with um, Ferdinand Ward. Grant, one day, uh, they had a house in Long Branch, uh, New Jersey. Uh, Julius serves him a plate of delicious peaches, and he bites into one of the peaches and says, ouch. That peach stung me for some reason. And it was the first time he realized there was a problem with his throat. He finally, with some delay, consulted his doctor in New York, who found a cancerous mass on his throat and uh, tongue. Um, it was um, incurable. Uh, and so Grant realized that this was a terminal illness. And he was petrified that not if, but really when he died. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Julia would be left destitute mm. because they'd lost all their money. So he decided to do something that he swore he wouldn't do. He wrote his memoirs. Mm -hmm. So during the last year of his life, in excruciating pain, and with his mind often fogged by the opiates, he managed to write a memoir that is considered the greatest military memoir probably in the English language. He wrote 10,000 words in a day while he had throat cancer. Yeah, and, and his publisher was Mark Twain. And one wonderful letter, you know, uh, Mark Twain writes to somebody, he said, Grant wrote 10,000 words today. He said, it kills me these days to even write 5,000 words in a, mm -hmm. in a day. He couldn't believe Grant's uh, productivity. And this memoir really poured uh, out of him. And many people imagine that Twain uh, wrote the, the memoirs. Twain wrote, their style is flawless. No man can improve upon them. Why is Grant buried in New York City, and what was his funeral like? Yeah, because um, the last few years of their lives, uh, um, Ulysses and Julie Grant were living on East 66th Street uh, in Manhattan. His funeral, I was just thinking about his funeral today because of the uh, John McCain mm -hmm. um, memorial gathering at uh, National uh, Cathedral. Um, when Grant was buried um, in uh, New York, and that, that he and Julie felt very grateful to uh, New York, and the city provided this beautiful spot um, in the New Riverside uh, Park. Um, Grant's funeral spoke to the public very much in the way that John McCain's memorial services have been speaking to the public. That is, uh, at Grant's um, funeral, a million and a half people flooded New York City. The funeral parade went on for five hours. But Grant and his family made a statement. Um, so and it was a north-south reconciliation. There were. Um, as among the honorary pallbearers, there were great Union generals, William Tecumseh Sherman and Phil Sheridan, but there were also major Confederate generals, Joseph Johnston and Simon uh, Buckner. Um, again, as part of this reconciliation theme, the uh, Stonewall Jackson Brigade from Staunton, Virginia, came up and marched in the parade. Black regiments marched in the parade, because Grant had been very instrumental during the Civil War in terms of recruiting and training and equipping. Mm -hmm you know, black uh, soldiers. And so this was really Grant's final statement from beyond uh, the grave. And I think that, uh, you know, Grant in many ways um, reminds me what people have been saying about uh, John McCain in terms of his uh, patriotism, um, his um, bravery, uh, his dedication to public service, the fact that he distinguished himself both in civilian service and in uh, military service, and kind of reminds us of what old-fashioned patriotism should look like. Last question before we take some questions from the audience. Uh, as we reconsider Grant, as you have in this magnificent book, what should we learn from Grant and his leadership? Well, I think that one reason people have responded to the book, you know, all the other people that I've written about um, were seem to be instant successes in life. They were sort of built for success, mm -hmm. that kind of great drive and energy and focus. Grant uh, didn't. And I think people are responding to the book because the highs are as high as any story in American history, but the lows are a lot uh, lower. You know, So that this is a story with a lot of light and shadow. It's a story about a man who suffered repeated failures and uh, uh, setbacks. Uh, in fact, as I was coming into the, to, to the room, someone said to me, I loved your Grant because it's the greatest story about a comeback. Come <laughs> and there were repeated comebacks in Grant's uh, life. You know, success was kind of a, a greasy pole, and he would keep slipping back down the pole, and then he would have to work his way back up again. Terrific. If there are any questions uh, for Ron, we'd be happy to take a few. Um. Um, hello. Uh, 
Very good book. Uh, loved it. Uh, just want to uh, ask a quick comment on Grant's relationship with George Armstrong Custer and uh, how you described um, that relationship in the book. It was a very, it was a very troubled uh, relationship, and uh, Grant was uh, very, very uh, critical of uh, Custer. Really blamed Custer for the massacre at uh, Little Bighorn. Felt that he was really, you know, not following um, uh, orders, and you know, put himself uh, and his uh, men in harm's way. Custer also had been uh, an outspoken critic of Grant as president, and that certainly helped to fuel the animosity. Um, I'm going to have who we, if okay. we get my speech, hope here. Yes, so I'm going to read two questions uh, by Becky. Sure. Um, if Grant had gone by his first name, would anything be different? <laughs> uh. <laughs> Secondly, what is happening with the adapt adaptation? I know someone mm -hmm. bought the rights. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Good okay, first, you know, Grant's name. He was born Hiram Ulysses Grant, uh, which gave him the unfortunate initials H U G or Hug. <laughs> uh, and he was mercilessly teased by the other boys, so he dropped the uh, Hiram and became just plain uh, Ulysses. Then, when local congressmen nominated him for West Point, he bungled the name. He sent it in as Ulysses S. Grant. I actually found one letter where Ulysses is writing to Julia, who wanted to know what the S stood for. His own wife didn't know what it stood for. <laughs> and he wrote back this funny letter, and he says the S stands for absolutely nothing. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, the, um, it's not going to be hip hop musical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> shucks. Um, but it, it will be a feature film, and it's going to be uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, which oh, is very exciting. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Produced by Leonardo DiCaprio, which is also exciting. Uh, and it looks like I'll again be the historical consultant. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've written about Washington and Hamilton and now Grant. Are there any lessons or a big lesson that you've learned through studying these that you think is worth sharing? Oh, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. You know, one strange thing, um, when people have asked me about a common denominator to these uh, lives, um, the one thing in every person that I've written about, they had to cope from an early age with a difficult, even impossible parent. I know this sounds like a strange response to your question, but you know, there was Washington with the very self-centered mother, there was Hamilton with the absentee father, Grant had this very domineering and overbearing uh, father. And I think that there's something about coping with a very, very difficult parent that I guess shapes character <laughs> and forces people to be self-reliant at uh, an early age. Kind of big frustration I found with all of these books is that all the people I've written about, because they had such difficult parents, they never talked about it. And uh, sometimes I imagine, you know, if they could, if I could conjure them to life and ask them questions, I think I'd want to zero yeah. in on the family dynamics. Mm -hmm. Grant was partnered with a Ponzi, a Ponzi schemer. Did he play any part in catching him? The Ferdinand Wood? I I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understood the question. But... Grant was partnered with a Ponzi schemer, Ferdinand right. Wood. Did he play any part in catching him? Well, uh, catch him. Not, mm -hmm. oh, and catching him. Did he catch him, help catch him? No, would that he had. Um, you know, what happened, Grant was um, uh, inexcusably complacent that um, Ferdinand Ward put all of the securities of the firm in this safe to which only Ferdinand Ward had access. Grant should never have allowed that. Ferdinand Ward would even put letters, you know, signed by Grant in front of Grant, and Grant would sign them without reading the, uh, uh, the letters. Grant felt because there were a lot of um, sophisticated Wall Street people uh, who were investing with uh, uh, Ward that he was absolutely certain you know, that Ward must be uh, sound. He should have been uh, suspicious because some of the people who were getting like 15, 20 percent per month, you know, boy, if that doesn't raise, mm -hmm. you know, warning flags, what did? But I wish that I could tell you that uh, Grant had been uh, part of exposing uh, Ward, uh, but was, was, was not. Uh, what happened was that the, the bank that was lending Ward um, uh, money uh, went bust and then the whole scheme blew up. We have time for one more question. As someone whose legacy has been unjustly tarnished, 
what has it been like to write this overdue exculpation of Grant? Yeah, it's been you know very very nice because when I published the book on uh, uh, Grant, uh, I felt that you know he was suffering from this image that he was just this crude, brutal butcher, and that was why he was a successful uh, uh, general. And in fact, you know there were six Union generals who fought against Robert E. Lee before uh, uh, Grant with the same advantage in manpower material. They could not defeat Lee, uh, Grant could. I felt that Grant's presidency had been portrayed as um, a failed presidency, and I think that in many ways it was a very successful presidency in terms of protecting African-American community in the South. To the extent that the book you know, um, had a revisionist bent, I thought there would be more resistance, and yet people <laughs> kind of accepted the portrait of Grant uh, more readily than I thought would happen. So I'm happy for that, although I was a little surprised. Please join me in thanking Mr. Ron Turner. <laughs>